Hi, my name is David Morrison. I'm a NASA space scientist, and I'd like to talk to you briefly about Comet Element. August is the month that can start getting really bad. They say August through November, roughly. But it's going to be six years at that time. The reason why you need to be underground or in a cave or something of that nature, when the pole shift goes, we lose our magnetic shield. That means UVA, UVB, UVC coming directly from the sun. Now, full blast, just like it is on Mars right now. It's going to be hitting the surface. You don't want to be out in that. As will microwaves from the sun. Question, why have not we been informed about this? 50 years ago, NASA formed them like this. They built dumps, deep underground military facilities. They have enough room for the elite and the government. They've been building them for 50 years. That's where they're planning on hiding. And the heck with us. And they've been storing food and oxygen. And in the past few years, they've been running the plants that make nuclear fuel rods to power their dumps. 300 tons a year each, and actually it's the making of the nuclear fuel rods is what destroyed the ozone because they are exempt from the CFC laws. So they're going to leave the public on their own. Right now, as of today, they are stationing, stationing our troops around their dumb entrances, and they've brought troops in from Israel and from Russia to deal with the public, because they won't be afraid to shoot at you. This isn't even a comet. It's something massive. A brown dwarf, perhaps, which would be a, a small star with a hundred times the mass of Jupiter. Well, that's simply impossible. First, the very fact that it has this extended atmosphere and tail shows that it has low gravity. If it were a massive high-gravity object, the gas couldn't escape, and we wouldn't see any of that. If it were a massive object, it would really be screwing around in the orbits of the planets as it came through the inner solar system. But there's been no change in the orbit of Mars, no change in the orbit of the Earth, no influence at all. These are just manufactured fears. Comet Elenum is just the most recent in this phenomenon of people's fear of the cosmos. They're afraid of things that are happening. Of course, the big story is they're afraid of this fictional planet Nibiru that doesn't exist that's supposed to do damage to us in December of 2012. There's a whole mythology here. And none of it is based on fact. It's all fantasy. It's all wild speculation. The most strange claim, and one that's gotten a lot of attention, is that somehow Common Element was responsible for the big earthquake in Japan last month. There's no way a comet could cause an earthquake. In fact, there's no way any celestial object can trigger an earthquake. The Japan earthquake was slippage on a major fault, a boundary between plates that make up the Earth's crust that reduces, releases a lot of energy, and, and this happens repeatedly. In fact, that fault is one of the most active faults on Earth, although this earthquake was exceptionally large. I can assure you the comet had nothing to do with it.
me just conclude by mentioning the issue of credibility. Some websites say that you can't believe the government or NASA, that we are hiding objects like Nibiru or the brown dwarf with Eleanor. And this is just really crazy to a scientist, because we know that the science comes from the academic community. There are very few scientists who work for the government. Most of the telescopes are operated by universities. Even NASA's Hubble telescope is operated by a university team. It's the other way around. The scientists provide the information to NASA, not the reverse. And if you can imagine trying to silence 100,000 astronomers who with their telescopes could be tracking Nibiru or Elenon or any of these fictitious objects, I can tell you, you couldn't keep six astronomers quiet with an order from the government, let alone 100,000. That she and her classmates were scared about Nibiru and could I please explain from a science point of view, why we know Nibiru is not real and is not a danger. You know, the, the simplest thing to say is just that there is no credible evidence whatever for the existence of Nibiru. Uh, there are no pictures, there is no tracking, there is no astronomical observations. In fact, the origin of the name is a little weird. Nibiru was a minor god in the Babylonian pantheon, probably associated with Jupiter, Nibiru was a minor god in the Babylonian pantheon, probably associated with Jupiter. There's no record that they ever thought of it as a planet. Sometimes we talk about planet X, but that's a strange term too, because astronomers say planet X for an object that has not been found, a, a possible object like Pluto. When it was being searched for, it was called planet X. Once it was found, it became Pluto. So, there really isn't any evidence here to counter, but I can quite specifically say how we know that Nibiru, or Planet X, does not exist and does not threaten the Earth. First, if there were a planet headed into the inner solar system that was going to come close to the Earth in December of 2012, it would already be inside the orbit of Mars. It would be bright, it would be easily visible to the naked eye. If it were up there, you could see it. All of us could see it. And the crazy thing is people who say they are observing it but never tell us where to look so we can verify. Well, remember that the idea is it's on an orbit of 3,600 years. If it had come through in the past, its gravity would have messed up the orbits of the inner planets. The Earth, Venus, Mars probably would have stripped the Moon away completely. Instead, in the inner solar system, we see planets with stable orbits. We see the moon going around the Earth. The very existence of this stability in the inner solar system proves that no rogue planet, no interfering object has come through the inner solar system in at least a million years. So it's not real. Nibiru doesn't exist. We can't see it. We can't detect its gravity. And we don't see a signature of its previous passages because there weren't any. The last passage was during the Jewish exodus, approximately 3,600 years ago. Nobody knows for sure the exact date because during these passages, uh, mankind is just discombobulated. They stop keeping records, records are lost, so nobody can exactly pinpoint the date. Our Earth gives evidence that we have had periodic pole shifts. Um, there is mountain building in and of itself is evidence. These mountains are like push together. If you're in an airplane and you look down at foothills, for instance, it almost looks like a rumpled blanket, like somebody took a blanket and pushed it and rumpled it. Mountains are, are forced upwards with great masses of rock snapping. Uh, this is signs of, of great pressure, not the gentle squeezing and pushing that happens with earthquakes at all. Indeed, uh, the, our Earth has had these periodic uh, pole shifts. You can see that in the evidence of the Earth uh, go back every period, time period and you can see other changes during these passages and when we have pole shifts and violent geological earthquakes and changes and the like, shifting the, of the tipping of the earth and shifting of the crust, uh, volcanoes explode. Um, and when they do, there's a lot of molten lava pouring out. Well, lava will, being molten, will line up with the current magnetic field. And when lava hardens, that's a permanent freeze, indicating 
the direction of magnetism at that moment in time. Well, this is one way that they've determined uh, the wandering pole theory, where they've identified places in Earth where they say, uh, at, at one time this appears to have been the North Pole, or that appears to have been the South Pole, is through this frozen lava um, alignment. For instance, off of Japan, there's cities and roads that they find under the water. In Bermuda, you see roads and walls and the like. Uh, likewise, land can rise. Uh, Atlantis is rumored to be a continent that went under the waves during one of these cataclysmic uh, passages. Jupiter's largest moons were first seen 400 years ago in early 1610. Hello and welcome. I'm Jane Houston Jones at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. On the 7th of January, 1610, in Padua, Italy, Galileo looked up above the constellation Orion. He aimed his telescope at the well-known starry wanderer, the planet Jupiter, which was near Orion that night. What he saw through his telescope startled him and marked the beginning of modern astronomy. Jupiter was not just one object, as he wrote and drew in his journal. There are three stars in the heavens moving about Jupiter, as Venus and Mercury around the sun, he wrote. Galileo's January 7th observation showed three stars. The one star to the west was Ganymede, and to the east there were two objects. One was the moon Callisto, and the other was a tight pairing of Io and Europa. Io and Europa appeared so close together they looked like one object in Galileo's modest telescopic view. On January 8th, he saw a different lineup altogether. There were three stars on one side of the planet. Io was the moon closest to the planet, followed by Europa and Ganymede. Two cloudy nights and two additional observations later, on January 13th, Galileo identified a fourth object orbiting Jupiter. The arrangement this night turned out to be Europa on the east and Ganymede, Io, and Callisto on the west. On January 15th, all four stars were seen on one side of the planet. Everyone who aims a modest telescope or even binoculars at Jupiter will see the same view that Galileo did. The views of tiny moons orbiting the king of the planets will surprise and delight all who look up. Next we have Jupiter, called the king planet. It is the largest planet in the solar system and it is about to go into the view of Virgo very soon and stay there for 41 weeks, which is the normal period of gestation. Very interesting, the king planet is going to go into almost, uh, you know, into a perfect pregnancy term. That's from November 2016 to September 2017. Named after the god of the sky and the god of thunderbolt, he is the king of the gods. In mythology, he defeated Kronos, or Saturn, and the Titans, and he saved his siblings. So he's kind of a mixed metaphor, representing both the second generation of hybrid, there are many generations of the hybrid, they map it out with a family tree. These guys who are very intelligent gave us you know, calculus and uh, amazing, uh, uh, well not calculus, you need to uh, admit that, but you know, amazing geometry and we can take a the science. Uh, these people took the mythology of the, of the gods very seriously. And their gods were not gods like we think of. Not a god that lives forever and, you know, is impervious to pain and destruction, but these gods were jealous, they fought each other, they betrayed each other, they killed each other, and it's very much like the mythology of the Hebrews. So something was going on on the Earth around that time, around the same time, where all these very intelligent civilizations reported the same stories. So uh, Jupiter is the, the main guy, and he also represents not only the hybrid, but he also represents the Son of God. The son of God. Because he defeats Saturn. Saturn is, you know, sounds just like Satan, isn't it? That's in his country. Alright, Saturn is a very beautiful planet, but uh, its number tells us something ominous. It is the sixth planet. And you know six is not a good number. Six is not a good number. Six, six, six. Bad. You don't have to know much in the Bible. You know it much bad. Well, what is so bad about Saturn? He's a bad boy. There is a mysterious six-sided hexagon on its north pole. The hexagon is a symbol of the devil. Six is a symbol of the devil. There's something really is strange about this planet because a hexagon is not a naturally occurring shape in nature, and yet 
the six well-defined sides maintain shape even 